It's a kind of a mysterious place. But really, it's your very own time machine because if you come here, this island's the same way it was 400 years ago when Samuel de Champlain landed on this beach. Well, Isla Haute is a jagged chunk of rocks topped by beautiful trees um, plopped down in the middle of the highest tides of the world surrounded by these uh, dangerous tidal currents. But as inaccessible and isolated and hostile as it seems to us nowadays, it was once a tremendous crossroad for people, all kinds of people traveling on the Bay of Funday. So much of my fictional landscape has been inspired here. It feels like a gift. And to be able to share that with people when you see them land on the beach and have some time here where all they hear is the wind and there's no light pollution and there's the sound of the birds and the crackle of the fire and the world falls away. Hello, I'm Tom Murphy. Welcome to Land and Sea. In the Bay of Fundy, there's an island so shrouded in mystery that some people swear it looks like it's floating and moves from day to day. But it is out there, and those who have discovered its rugged charms believe the historic island must be preserved. Today, three people with deep connections to Il Oat have met in Advocate Harbour. They're about to embark on an adventure to a remarkable island. Dan Conlon is an historian who's writing a book about Il Oat. His sister Christiane Conlon is an author whose books are inspired by the island. And Bill Casey is a federal politician who's trying to protect Il Oat for future generations. This morning, Christy Ann has brought along her 11-year-old son, Silas. They're going to stay the night, and because there are no amenities on the island, they have to take everything they need with them. Ilote is in the upper bay of Fundy, at the entrance to the Minas Basin. The island was formed during the Jurassic period, when what is now Europe and Africa drifted away from North America. Lava flows created layers of basalt rock. Glaciers came and went, and after they melted, the Bay of Fundy gradually flooded, eventually isolating Ilot from the mainland. The French explorer Samuel de Champlain first visited the island in 1604 and called it Ilot. It means high island, named for its steep 100-meter cliffs. The island is now owned by the Canadian government, and anyone who wants to visit the island must obtain permission from the Canadian Coast Guard. Today's trip is a 20-minute boat ride on smooth seas. Bill Casey first came to the island when he was a teenager. My brother and I had been looking at this island for a long, long time, and we decided to venture out Good day, uh, nice, nice day, calm winds, so we came to the island. Uh, we had read about it and heard about it and uh, we came, and I just still remember, we did exactly the same thing as we still do today. We go down the east side and we stopped at the cove where all the birds are. It was, uh, I, I don't know, but the impact left a, an impression with me for the rest of my life and I still come back every year if we can. Dan Conlon first visited the island as a Boy Scout in the 1970s. My family has a cottage in Turner Brook right beside Harborville on the Kings County side. And some of my earliest memories uh, ever are just playing on the beach there. And then I look up and I would see this mysterious island shimmering on the horizon that seemed to change size and change location depending on the type of day. And uh, as a child, I wanted to visit that island so much. It was like looking up at the moon and it seemed just, you know, uh, unobtainable. Yeah. Christy Ann also remembers trips to Il Oat as an annual tradition for the Conlon family. My earliest memory is being a kid and trying to come up the steep, steep barrier beach at about 6.30 in the morning with the sun rising and the seagulls squawking and slipping and sliding on the rocks as the island looms up half dark, half on fire with the sunrise. And 
eagles flying down and per peregrine falcons coming out and feeling like I had somehow come to the edge of the world. There's only one place on the northeast of the island where it's safe to land. There's no wharf, so it's difficult for the boat to get close to shore. There are hidden boulders underwater that can damage the zodiac. The captain can't drop an anchor because it could become snagged between the rocks, so a dinghy is used to ferry the campers and gear ashore. They've timed today's landing to coincide with high tide. The longer they delay, the more the tide will retreat, exposing a rocky beach of unstable boulders. They're so slippery, it makes walking treacherous. There's only one area close to the shore that's flat enough for tents. There's an old campfire pit, even an old weathered wooden lawn chair that's been left behind. Although Bill Casey visits the island almost every summer, this is the first time he stayed overnight. Despite it being July, there are no mosquitoes or black flies on Ilot and no ticks. The island is just three kilometers long and only a half a kilometer wide. It's an important resting place for migratory birds. The peregrine falcon nests here. It's home to the red-tailed salamander. There are no mammals on the island except for deer mice, and harbor seals and gray seals are common. It's a, it's a time capsule, it's, it's the wildlife, it's the mystery, it's the beauty. On the south end of the island, you can go amongst the rocks, and the seals are here, the seals are here, and, and then there's this there's basalt rock there that is, is it's, it's, it looks like cubes, and uh, it's just really, really interesting structures. And, but the whole thing is fascinating, the whole island is fascinating. I quickly discovered uh, from my first few years of visiting Isla Haute that uh, it has many names depending on where people are from. Uh, there are 220 kilometers of coastline for which the Isla Haute is the dominant feature on the horizon, and people call it different names. On the Kings County, Annapolis County, where I'm from, people call it Isla Haute. Um, on the Cumberland County side, they call it Isla Haute. And then uh, on the New Brunswick side, um, St. Martin's Alma, they call it um, Il Haute. Um, and uh, so it's, it's, it's kind of interesting. It has this relationship with all these diverse communities. And um, the name, of course, comes Samuel Champlain named it because of the high cliffs, uh, the high island in French. Um, the uh, Americans who had come up here fishing in the 18th century, they, Il Holt was too hard for them. They called it Holt's Island and imagined that a Mr. Holt had, had settled here. So it's an island that uh, fascinates many, known by many names. It, what's interesting is when you camp here, it could be, it's almost lost in time. You cook over a campfire and sleep in a tent. It's been a huge part of our lives coming over here. When we come back, the culture and history of Ilot. The island Ilote in the upper bay of Fundy is so remote, not many people even know it exists. But for those who've watched it from the shore, it's a mysterious place, often shrouded in fog, sometimes disappearing entirely. In the late 18th and early 19th century, coastal settlements began to spring up around the bay of Fundy, and fishing boats and sailing ships passed by the island. I like to think of these, you know, massive wooden ships built on every side of the Bay of Funday, first uh, um, hoisting their sails to catch the wind and sail the world's ocean going right past the Isle of Haute. Uh, uh, ships famous like, you know, the William D. Lawrence, the largest wooden ship ever built in, in Canada, sailed past this island. Mary Celeste, the famous mystery ship built as the Amazon, sailed past this island. So all this time the island is a vital landmark for these mariners. And with the increase in ship traffic came shipwrecks. Uh, we have first recorded shipwreck is in 1786. Interestingly enough, a recreational group coming over from Port George to pick berries on the island and their sloop got wrecked and they were stranded here for a week building signal fires to attract people. After that shipwreck, there were many more. And so in 1878, the Government of Canada built a lighthouse on the highest point of the island, 100 meters above sea level. The light could be seen almost 40 kilometers across the Bay of Fundy. 
Captain Nelson Card was the first of several lighthouse keepers on the island. With the help of horses and men, he cleared a road a kilometer and a half long from the rocky beach up through the thick Acadian forest to the lighthouse. Bill Casey and Dan Conlon set off on the demanding trek to the site where the old lighthouse once stood. Casey has climbed up to the site before, but today he's getting a personal history lesson from Dan Conlon. So you can still see traces of the original lighthouse road that Captain Card built in 1877, including ditches and culverts. All hand dug, three guys with shovels. They used to have some great horses on the island. They never had a tractor or a truck out here. It was all human and animal muscle. And the horses used to know the way intimately and know where to rest. Oh, yeah. And they, they would hear a boat coming and they would start, start coming down to meet the boat. At its peak, there was the lighthouse, a house, a barn, and a cleared cow pasture. So you can see the original 1878 foundation right beside the steel skeleton tower that replaced it when it burned. Oh, yeah. So there you go, the steel skeleton tower, beautifully silhouetted by the fog. Yeah. Barn was where those three spruce trees are in the fog. Yeah. Uh, oil shed was in between the barn and the, um, and the tower. Yeah. And the house was built right into the tower, kind of a very yeah. convenient arrangement. And there was a chicken coop just in front of us here. Most lighthouse keepers have led solitary lives, but that wasn't the case here. In the 1930s and 40s, Il Oat was often a destination for parties and picnics. That all came to an end in 1956, when the lighthouse and the house burned to the ground. After the fire, the lighthouse was replaced by the automated light tower, which is still in operation today. These days, a helicopter pad sits at the highest point of the island. It allows Canadian Coast Guard staff to access the island by air. They come in to do service and inspections. And they're still How out here, they do that? oh, probably once or twice a year. Yeah. Um, more if they get a call that the light's not working. Oh, it's well built. Yeah, it's pretty sturdy. You can see lots of visitors have left little calling cards. Yeah. But human activity on Il Oat goes back well before the first lighthouse, and much further than Samuel de Champlain's 1604 visit to the island. Historical evidence places the Mi'kmaq on Il Oat as far back as 10,000 years ago. A scallop dragger, a um, uh, dragon for, um, for shellfish off the eastern tip of the island, dragged up a stone tool called an ulu, which fell out of use about 10,000 years ago, and they found it right beside the Isle of Haute. So that gives you an idea of long human history. And there's more recent evidence that the island was part of Mi'kmaq life. And um, the Mi'kmaq um, use the island extensively. If you know where to look, there are tent rings, remnants of wigwams uh, all up and down the beach. Ilot was also refuge for Acadians in 1756 when British soldiers forced the French from their land. A group of Acadians had uh, escaped the deportation roundup but had almost starved to death on Morden on the, Bay of, on the uh, Minneapolis Valley side. And then um, one of the um, veteran Acadian um, mariners, Pierre Melançon, canoed all the way across the Bay of Funday, um, stopped off at Isle Haute, rested, and then got to Brunswick where he met a band of Mi'kmaq and they came back across the bay, rescued the Acadians, and took them off to New Brunswick, and they escaped the British. Um, so we have kind of, you know, the Isle of Haute again serving as this important little crossover place. These days, Dan Conlon keeps a visitor's logbook on the island to keep track of who's visiting Ilote. Dan started the first logbook in 2001, and when people filled up that one, he brought a second book to the island. And now that one is almost completely filled. Uh, I was curious about the other people who visited here, what they thought about and who they were, and it's a really neat snapshot of uh, people and their connections to Isla Haute. Dan expected people to write about the weather and what they saw on the island, but he's been getting much more than that. People's uh, names and dates and what they saw on the island and, and much to my interest what they thought and felt about on the island. People even write poetry, do watercolor paintings. Um, it's always revealing and insightful to see what people think and, uh, and are inspired by their visit here. The island rises up in front of the boat, the northeast end, the only part not surrounded by cliffs, where there is a beach. To the left, the remains of old fishing sheds and a saltwater pond that rises and falls with the tide. At the end of the pond, there is a long rocky split slithering out into the water, Riptides raging where the massive currents of the bay collide. 
Dan's sister, Christy Ann Conlon, has been so moved by the island, she's written two novels filled with imagery and characters inspired by Ilot. So I think it implanted itself in my, my creative landscape. And so later when I started writing uh, novels and stories and stage plays, the, the world of the island and the connection between the island and the mainland started to create the, the fictional worlds where I've created all of my stories. And it's not just Christiane Conlon who's been inspired to write stories based on the island. Many mysterious tales abound. And there was always some young sucker who put his hand up and say, I'll stay, sir, thinking that he could stick around and dig it up and keep it all for himself later. And the moment he said that, the older pirates would grab the young sailor, chop off his head, and throw his body into the pit with the gold and silver, and then bury him with it. When we come back, pirates, treasure, and the legends and lore of Illo. And they dug really deep, and there's, there's dozens of these holes. That some parts of the island look like a World War I battlefield with all these craters. The isolated island Ilot in the middle of the Bay of Fundy is a mysterious place. It's frequently cloaked in fog, barely visible from the mainland. Its steep cliffs, surrounded by high tides and strong currents, make it a challenging place to visit. But despite that, for thousands of years, it's been an important meeting place. First for the Mi'kmaq, and later Acadians facing deportation. And in more recent years, it's become a destination for treasure hunters. Uh, people started telling te treasure stories about Isla Haut in the 19th century, about how the island moves every seven years. And should you be on the island the moment it moves, a column of flame will erupt and go to the sky, and a headless pirate will jump out marking the location of the treasure. Even though these are mythical stories, and it's against the law to dig on Ilot without the supervision of an archaeologist, that hasn't stopped those dreaming of a life-changing discovery. And so treasure hunter after treasure hunter have been drawn to the Isla Haute uh, with all kinds of crazy schemes, and a lot of them had their favorite places, uh, rock oat crops that were convinced the treasure was buried. And so treasure hunters have left their mark, especially on the northeast area of the island, at the edge of Ilot's saltwater pond. And they've dug really deep, and there's, there's dozens of these holes that some parts of the island look like a World War I battlefield with all these craters. Dan Conlon discovered that the Mi'kmaq brought stones from all around the Bay of Fundy to make tools on Ilot. Right beside the treasure pit, you can see scattered on the ground um, all these remnants of uh, um, tool production, indigenous tool production. Looks like it's a fine grained bit of quartz. That's, it's got the nice uh, jasper red on it. And it's got the sharp edge, the type of thing that the uh, tool makers would chip away till and so they found the perfect piece that just said spear point. Uh, there's a ton of this stuff that's unfortunately been spewed all around by the treasure hunters digging their pits and wrecking the layers of evidence that an archaeologist could study and learn a lot about the mysteries about why people were making the tools and how long and who they were trading with. And it's not just the treasure hunters that are threatening the rich archaeological history of Ilot. In 2001, the Canadian government considered selling the entire island to the highest bidder. Bill Casey was shocked when he read about it in Canadian Geographic magazine. For sale, one island. What a headline. For centuries, tiny Isla Haut off the Nova Scotia shore in the Bay of Fundy has hosted Aboriginals, picnickers, scientists alike. Its cornucopia of flora, fauna, and stunning geological features is now on the auction block. I saw the headline and then the map of Nova Scotia and Il Hout was highlighted. And I was scared, you know, I was scared because if it went to an individual from another country or a corporation from another country, the, the uniqueness of the island could be destroyed. And it's one of the last places in Nova Scotia that you can go and know that this is exactly the way it was four, five, six hundred years ago. And I would be ashamed to lose that. As a member of Parliament from Nova Scotia, Casey is now fighting to save the island as a natural preserve. He hopes the island will be taken over by the Canadian Wildlife Federation and protected forever for future generations.
I, I don't know how I can uh, rate the importance of it, but it's just everything to me. I mean, it's just really critical that this not slip away from the people of Nova Scotia, the people of Canada. And uh, I, I, don't, I don't know how I can say it any more than that. I mean, I, I'm totally committed to it, have been for 16 years. No, it's been, I've, I've never lost sight of it for a minute, and I, and I won't. It is um, a unique ecosystem, it's also a delicate ecosystem. It could be very vulnerable to things like fire, poor development. So um, I'm hoping the island will be preserved. And I'm hoping that preservation can also include this traditional visitation that many communities from the Bay of Fundy have come here in small numbers, but consistently, many of them with their deep long-term relationships with the island and has on the whole done a very good job of looking after the island. So I'm hoping that uh, whatever preservation em emerges, that, that sort of that continuing community connection can remain. I think seeing it as this pro provincial treasure and it, it embodies the history and the culture and uh, so it's a, it's a treasure really for, for the province. It encapsulates the history of the area and the natural beauty and I, I love to come here where people can come and have a very simple camping experience and experience the peace and have some time here where all they hear is the wind and there's no light pollution and there's the sound of the birds and the crackle of the fire and the world falls away. Mm -hmm.